Hey everyone, and welcome to the last part of our JASP series for an undergraduate statistics course. So in this section, we're covering part 12, which is chi-square. So if you're watching this, order or not, up to this point, everything has been parametric statistics. Parametric statistics require a dependent variable that is at least interval or ratio, meaning somewhat contiguous. There's a whole second set of statistics that are non-parametric in nature, meaning that the dependent variable can be categorical or ordinal. So the other half of numbers in our, in our types of data here. So we're gonna cover the chi-square test for independence. Okay, this is where you have at least two categorical variables and only categorical variables. And it's a very popular test to determine if there's some sort of relationship between two count variables. Okay, so they're frequency counts of different categories. Um, there's also a chi-square test for goodness of fit when you only have one categorical variable. And it's the same basic concept as what we're going to do here, except we're going to do the more complicated one, so then you should be able to also do the simpler one. Okay. So, what is the chi-square test? Well, the chi-square test for independence requires you have at least two categorical variables, and you're trying to decide if they're related. Much in the same way that you think about correlations, things being related to each other, except we kind of think about linearity really. Like I can't think like one goes up, the other goes down, that kind of concept, or they're both increasing together, right? Instead, you're just trying to determine if there's some sort of pattern to the data that implies that these two variables kind of go together. Okay. It's called a chi-score test for independence because you're trying to determine if they're independent which is the null hypothesis. Are these things totally separate or are they related? Okay. Which is actually the basically the null hypothesis for a correlation, right? Is the correlation zero? These things are totally different, they're independent. Or is there a correlation in the research hypothesis that implies that they're related? Okay. Chi-square works the same way. Are these two things independent, meaning they're not related, or are they related okay, for the research hypothesis? And so, um, for as an example here in the notes, we could think about if a person who exercises is likely to get heart disease. Okay. So your two variables would be exercise, and we could break that into exercises and doesn't, which is a really simple way to think about that, right? And then presence of heart disease, yes and no. Okay. If there's a relationship between those variables, you could determine if the uh, does exercises has more in the no than the yes. Okay. And so we could also think about like preference for cars and males and females. So this is really good when the variables are labels instead of numbers. Okay. Now we could treat exercises as a continuous variable and in general it's a good practice to keep variables that are numbers and continuous as continuous. You've learned a lot of statistics to handle those already so leave them alone. Don't break them into groups. Okay, sometimes this is called median split or splitting the data. In general, that's not a good practice because you lose information. Right? Just like many students don't think it's fair to assign you a single letter grade at the end of the semester, right, where we're splitting the data into groups, that's the same way you should treat research projects. Right? So if the data is continuous, leave it as continuous if you can. All right, so what it technically does is try to determine if there's an association between two nominal variables. Okay. Mathematically, what happens is it takes the observed frequency. What the heck is an observed frequency? Okay, observed frequencies are the counts that are in the data. Okay, these are the actual uh, numeric uh, counts of your combination of variables. So how many people exercise and have heart disease? and then compares them to an expected set of frequencies. And I find this is where students tend to lose me, right? How would you know what to expect? Well, that's what we've been doing all semester, right? We've been comparing values to an expected value. Okay. And the way this generally works is, okay, if I have a sample of 20 people and uh, I know that there are 10 that exercise and 10 that don't, I might expect to find an equal distribution between the other variable. Okay, that would imply there's no difference between, or no association, no relationship between exercising and heart disease. 
it's not quite that simple, but it's this basic idea of like, what would I expect if there was no relationship between the variables? And yeah, mathematically, what that turns out to be is kind of a, a proportion based on the row and column totals. Okay, given how many people are in this row, how many people are also in this column? So let's add a quick example here to help clarify this expected thing, because I think this is the trickiest part about this test. If I can remember how Word works here. So let's say we have our exercises variable, and we have does not exercise. Exercise. Okay. Exorcist. Ooh, typo. Uh, heart disease. No heart disease. The observed values are what's in here. Okay, the actual counts in the data, and you'll see them in a minute. You'll see an example of this idea in a minute. It's not this particular example. Expected values are based on the row and column totals. Okay, so we would think about adding here row and a column. Oops, what is that word? I don't even know what that is. Total, try again. Row, no heart total. Uh, that's a column, so let's try this again. <laughs> you guys, I've had my coffee. There we go. This would be a row. Reso row exercise total and row no exercise total. And this would be total sample size. So these are the observed values here. So the expected value formula is simply a formula that I can like click on the button and insert a formula, right? Isn't that a thing? Eh, equation, there it is. Okay, so this ex expected formula is this idea of expected equals, okay, a the row total, okay, row total, times column total divided by sample size. Total total. Okay. So row total times column total divided by total sample size. So what that means is that this is a measure of what would I expect here, given that I have this many people who exercise and I have this many people who have heart disease. And so this is kind of like a proportion value, or it's a, it's a number, it's not a proportion. It's kind of a, a, a numeric value of like, well, so, you know, some people are more likely to exercise and some people are more likely to have heart disease. So I have to account for the fact that there are two variables going on here. Okay? So it's a combination of how many people I have in this particular row and this particular column. Okay? If there's no relationship between the variables, it should evenly distribute. Now, in reality, um, in a perfect world, we don't have an even distribu distribution of exercises versus not, right? We have some people who do, some people who don't. So we can't really make it totally even. So I can't take like one fourth of the sample because I have four cells. I have to bias it towards the categories that are naturally larger because there's just more people who exercise, for example. Okay. So this allows us to kind of control for the um, natural sample size in that population. And so if there's no relationship between the variables, it will map onto just the sample size that you would expect given that, you know, a small proportion of people have heart disease. So it's really kind of a clever way to think about um, a null hypothesis being no relationship based on the fact that, you know, there's this many people in the world that exercise. This is why representative samples really matter. Now, the further we get away from the observed values, so if the observed values and the expected values are very different, chi-square gets larger. So the statistic itself is a measure of mismatch. If the chi-square value is zero, that implies that the observed values and the expected values are perfectly equal. If the chi-square value is uh, very large, that implies that the observed values and the expected values are very different. Okay? And there's some sort of association between the variables that is present in the data. All right, so what are our assumptions? 
you think you would think moving away from parametric statistics we would lose the assumptions but what we've actually done is lessened them okay so parametric statistics tend to require more uh, assumptions Paramet non-parametric statistics people think don't have assumptions but really they just have less assumptions so the first one is about the type of data, just like we've done all semester, but now it's two categorical variables. Okay, this can be nominal or ordinal, remember ranks. But if you have an ordinal variable, sometimes other things, other statistics make sense. The nominal variables can be either two groups or more. Uh, let's see here. Assumption number two is independence of observations. Right? So that means that there's no relationship between cells based on the participant. So my data is my data only. Okay. I can't be in more than one cell. right? So I can't have heart disease and not have heart disease. I can only be in one of these four cells here. Okay. If you had a study where you tested people over time, that would mean that you'd need to do a different test because you don't have this. right? So um, keeping them separate. This is an independent groups design. If you remember t-test, we also had dependent groups design. That's a, to that's a different type of chi-square. All right. And so here's an explanation more too of independence. And then the trick, the like really the one we can check for is that we need to have cell counts that have expected values greater than five. Okay, and this often turns into do I have at least five people per square? Because then <laughs> Uh, then it might be uh, okay. So we don't want a bunch of zeros in our data, and we don't want a bunch of um, very low frequency cells. Because it's just hard to detect a relationship when the cells are uh, low counts. So let's jump in. The, observe, the null hypothesis for this test is that observed values equal expected values. There's no relationship between the variables. The alternative or research hypothesis is that their observed values don't equal the expected values and therefore there's some sort of relationship between X and Y. Now I've related this to a correlation, but this really could, relationship wise could mean a lot of different things. Okay, so we, when we did independent T, we talked about how the groups were different in their means. That means there's some sort of relationship there, right? So one group has a different score than the other group. Okay, they're um, increasing versus or decreasing versus the other group. So relationship here is kind of a loose word. It means that there's something that requires us to understand both variables at once. Okay. If I know about heart disease, I need to also know about exercises. Okay. That kind of idea. Okay. All right. So let's look at an example. So the thing about active individuals, males tend to engage more in competitive sports than females. Okay. Um, so let's see if that's true for people enrolled in an exercise science course. So we asked 25 males, 25 females, if they would participate in a competitive sport or non-competitive sport. And so they um, listed under comp what kind of sport they'd prefer and their genders related into the gender variable. So each person gets their own row just like we talked about at the beginning of the semester when we talked about tidy data principles. And so each person has two scores, what gender they're in and what um, option they selected for competitive. Okay. So let's see how that works out. All right, I'm gonna click my hamburger icon, click open, okay, computer, find the file that has your data, you have to enter that first. So I have gender and competitive sport. Here's the problem. That's labeled as ones and twos. That's no good. We covered this before in independent t-test, but let's just go over again about how to change these. So let's just give them labels here. So I'm gonna click on the name of the variable. Okay, when you hover over it, it says click here to change the labels and you're kind of like tempted to like try to catch it, but you just click on the variable name. Okay. Now let's see what they are. One, doo -doo -doo. one's male, two's female. And then one is yes and two is no. So one here is male. Notice how it changes when I do this, female. Okay. If I hit enter, I think, yeah. Click on the little X to make it go away. Click on comp. One here is yes, two here is no. Okay, click the little X. 
Now our data is labeled in a way that we can remember what everything meant. All right, now that does not change the underlying data set. It doesn't change the CSV file, but does save it in your JASP output. So is the dependent variable categorical? Yep, right, it's groups. Are there at least five participants expected in each cell? Well, to get that, what we can do, instead of using that formula and doing a bunch of hand calculations, bleh, is actually calculate the data. So we'll click frequencies, contingency tables, move one into rows, one into columns, doesn't matter which, right? and automatically we get our frequency table itself. And you'll notice here that it also is giving you the row and column totals like what I was doing. So I could do some math here. I could say, okay, 25 times 28 divided by 50. is 14. Okay. The real value is 18. So is that difference bigger than one would expect if there was no relationship? Right. Now let's see, how do we get these expected values? So you don't have to do that yourself because it can get quite tedious. Um, so let's click down on cells. Okay, and go, hey, you know what? Give me the expected values. Okay. So I'm gonna come over here, just make this a little easier to read. So you want to check the expected values, mainly in here. You don't have to check the expected total, really. Those add up. But we did 25 times 28 divided by 50. That's where the 14 came from. Okay, this one's also 14 because then split between men and women is even. Right, there's 25 in each one. So they line up like this because the row totals are the same. Okay, so given that I have 25 people, okay, but there's 28 in this column. So this does have to add up still. So, okay, well, men and women are equal, so comp here got evenly split. Now, if these were all perfectly equal, let's say we had 25, 25, 25, 25, this would be one-fourth of 50 each time. But notice how it biases it towards the yes, because there are more observed yeses. All right, so here are our expected counts. All of those are greater than five, so we should be good. All right, let's look at the chi-square test. Now that's already selected, it's already printed out down here, but let's add something to it. All semester we've talked about effect size, so let's add that bad boy. So under statistics here, click, uh, sorry, I lost it, uh, fee or Kramer's V. Um, so generally people ask for Kramer's V, um, mostly because as uh, our fee sometimes is used as a correlation type coefficient, but I like using uh, V because it scales, okay? Meaning if I had six columns, it would still be useful, okay? Mostly fee is a two by two, meaning there's two in one and two in the other. Now, it's a measure of the strength of association, okay? So here we go, so you only have, when you only have two, okay, you're gonna get the same answer when you have a two by two. Okay. So this is not suitable for anything other than a two by two, so in all ca other cases you should use Kramer's V. So I mostly just use this one because it's more suitable all the time. Okay, and a two by two, it gives me the same answer. So it's the same thing. Um, but do what your instructor wants, obviously, right? So, uh, can you can think about this in the same style as a correlation of negative one to one. Um, so we could say here that V is 0.32, which is similar to saying the correlation is 0.32, given the fact that I can't really correlate these, right? Like correlation implies this like linear or continuous relationship. This is not continuous at all. But if you think about it like a correlation, that can help you understand the size. So that would be about a medium effect size. The next thing down you'll see here, our chi-square test, is a chi-square value here, which is the measure of how different observed and expected values are. So it's actually, effectively, the same formula as standard deviation. So while we haven't really focused on formulas just a whole lot this semester, I'd like here to kind of insert that equation where what we're saying here is chi-square, so we'll just kind of cheat and not do the actual chi, save some time here, equals 
a ratio of um, observed values. So O square O values, O, O is this key, minus expected values squared divided by expected values. So if you remember the formula for standard deviation, which I know you've forgotten by now, or you've put it out of your head, you survived that chapter, right? Um, that formula is x minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1. This is the same idea. It's the difference on the top and the error on the bottom. Okay? So the, the difference here is observed minus expected squared divided by expected because there's that's our expected n value. And so I just want to relate that back to something that hopefully from the beginning of the semester you kind of vaguely remember because uh, chi-square is this fancy form of standard deviation. Most of the tests that we do are actually just a, a modified form of understanding the differences in variance, right? And the differences between uh, an observed score and what we might expect that score to be. So all those statistics can kind of be boiled down at this idea of like, here's my real data. Here's what I might expect the data to be. How different is that? All right, so now let's look at the actual chi-square value. So five points here is a measure of how different O versus E is. We can tell if that five points is more association than you would expect if the null were true, right? By looking at P. We're going to use P the same way we've used it all semester. So if it's less than 0.05 is our alpha or a type 1 error. We would say it's significant. If it's greater than 0.05, we'd say it's not significant. We're still searching for evidence here. So if it's less than 0.05, that provides evidence that the null is unlikely. If it's greater than 0.05, and it does not really tell us a whole lot about the null, about the research, so there's no evidence to reject the null. Okay. And so this implies that there is some sort of relationship there okay, between the variables. Degrees of freedom here is not based on sample size. I know I told you all semester it's n minus 1, but now it's based on the number of rows and columns. Okay. So it's rows minus 1 uh, times columns minus 1. All right, here's how you might write that up. We'd want to include Kramer's V. right? Um, and then how do I interpret this? Like, Often, you know, look, earlier in the semester, this wasn't so hard. Like, uh, group one's mean is higher than group two. But now I'm like, this is different than expected. People are going to be like, but how? Okay. And there's a couple ways to do that. I mean, the simplest one is to just look at it, right? How is it different than expected? Well, men are higher than expected and women are lower than expected in the competitive category. So it sort of implies that men are more likely to choose competitive sports. So they're lower than expected in the no category, and women are higher than expected in the no category, which supports our hypothesis. Your instructor might also ask you for, let's see if Jasper will do this. Um, does not look like it would, but there are also ways to count like how different from expected they are, um, which is uh, standardized residuals. But it doesn't look like it will give you that, so we'll leave that part out. But the idea here is uh, to interpret, we can just kind of also look at the scores. Like this is higher than expected. This one is lower than expected. So that supports our kind of a priori hypothesis that um, men have more in the competitive sports and women are more in the non-competitive sports. Okay. So here's how we might report that all together. Okay. Chi-score test. Remember, first step, talk about the test. Chi-square test was conducted between gender and preference for performing competitive sports. Tell us about the uh, data screening, the assumptions. All expected frequencies are greater than five. Good to go there. Tell us about the test. There's a, a no association between gender and preference. We include the chi-square statistic. And there's a moderately strong association between gender and preference for performing sports, and that's the symbol for phi. So we could do phi or v there. And if I wanted to, I could suggest uh, males were observed, or males were more likely, morally, more likely to perform competitive sports, while females were more likely to select non 
competitive. These are hard words this early in the morning. Sports. And then you would include the table. And since JASP gives us this nice formatted, beautiful table, we just want to maybe turn off the expected count. Just this would be a little bit cleaner for us. So we just turn it off briefly, paste it into Word. And we can include this as table one. Although, of course, it'll split the page here and it looks ridiculous, but this is in APA style. And so that would allow us to present the data for participants to choose for um, participants, readers to decide for themselves, right? So men are more likely in the yes column, women are more likely in the no column. So that's a chi-square test for independence. So you have survived the entire semester of JASP related things. And so this will be the last video in this series. But if you need more JASP content, I have more that's built for more advanced statistics on my channel. So thanks for following along with us on this semester and... Hope you've enjoyed.